What's up, everyone? Welcome to the 39th episode of the Boundless Business Podcast. As always, it's Nico, Larissa, and Justine here. T, good morning. How are we doing? Taylor Swift just released her newest album. I'm doing great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Larissa's been really excited for this for a couple of months now, to be honest. So I'm excited. Yeah, since it was announced, it's literally on, on my calendar of like, don't talk to me today unless it's about Taylor Swift. So... <laughs> Well, unfortunately, our podcast topic is not about Taylor Swift today, but oh, it no. is about, yeah, I know, sad day. <laughs> um, I could talk about Taylor Swift for the next 30 minutes if we decide to change our minds. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, the question we're going to try and answer today is, what do you need to do slash have as an agency to function successfully? So we kind of broke our operations into five different sections, sales, marketing, fulfillment, accounting and finance, and security. So we're going to go through each of these and talk about all things operations. So Larissa, take it away. So yes, this is a topic I'm really excited about because we see this all the time where we start talking to an agency and then we start to realize we're like, oh, the reason you're having these problems is because the operations in your agency are not functioning properly. So that's why we wanted to sit down and kind of break it into all these categories and go in depth piece by piece about what is important to have, what is important to prioritize, and how do all these things kind of work together. So I'll start with sales, Nico, feel free to, you know, kind of jump in here. Um, but before you, before we go down this rabbit hole, let, I just want to take a step out. When Larissa is saying, you know, we're talking to agencies and, you know, we're realizing that it's, it, it might not, the, the problem that they think they have, maybe they're thinking that it's actually like they need more leads or more sales might not actually be the problem that they're having. So there are agencies that are really good at operations. There are agencies that are really good at sales, but very few agencies are very proficient at both. Uh, we're very lucky where I'm a sales-focused individual. Um, Larissa is a sales-focused individual, but has the has the operational chops to actually be able to then streamline. So really like what we're talking about today is like, you might still have a, a lead generation, marketing retention problem, but with the right operations, that actually can be it can be a, a symptom and not the actual cause. So just want to, to echo why this is important because this, this is a way to increase profits and potentially increase uh, lifetime value. And frankly, maybe even since we're going to be talking sales uh, operations, like maybe increasing like your actual like close rate, the amount of people you can contact and all that. So just wanted to lay that out there. That this is when people hear ops, sometimes they think about like, like systems and processes, which it is in a sense, but there's more to it than just like automations and whatnot. So what that does for you. So sorry to interrupt, Larissa, I'm just really passionate about this after understanding it, because um, I was very skeptical at first. Yeah, you're totally fine. So I want to start with sales because everything kind of is going to stem from that, right? So it's really important to get your sales processes down first because that is the engine of your business. If you're not selling, you are not bringing in new business and you don't know what business is going out, right? So it's always the first priority. Even if you're having a bunch of other fires and issues, we recommend don't stop selling. If you lose clients, keep selling, keep getting new ones in the door while you fix those problems. That way you don't end up losing clients, having nothing new coming in, and then just kind of being a, a little bit screwed by the fact that you don't have anything going on. So keeping new business coming in the door is especially important all the time, especially if you have operational difficulties. So I certainly understand the uh, impulse to say, okay, things are on fire. We don't want to sell to any new clients. We've got to fix all those problems first. And the reality is, if you have those problems, the likelihood that you're going to lose the clients you currently have is already fairly high. It's best to get new ones in and fix it, uh, ideally for those, for all of them, for all your clients, but especially for the new ones coming in. So that's why like this is incredibly, incredibly important. 
always focus on sales. It's always the first priority. It's the bottom line of your growth and it goes hand in hand with every other aspect of your business. So when I talk about like sales ops and what you need to function successfully, you need to keep a couple things in mind, right? You need to have a really good offer and you need to tie that into your fulfillment. So you need to have an offer that your team can kill, can do amazing at. What we see really commonly people do is they create completely custom offers for every new person that comes in. For every new client that they get, they're doing 50 million things. None of it's consistent, meaning it's much harder to execute on the back end. And it's all being initiated at the sales process with no regard for the fulfillment. So that's why this is really important to tie it. So starting with sales, having a really awesome offer, but making sure it's an offer that's executable. That's key. You also want to make sure you're at the sales process, getting those expectations dialed in because the expectations mean a lot when it comes to clients. And the first person they're interacting with is whoever is selling them this product. So that's where all of this needs to stem from. You need to have great offer that sets the expectations and that helps manage that client moving forward should they move forward with you as an agency. Um, a couple key things that make the sales process just much easier is having a, basically a templated out proposal and contract format. You shouldn't be creating custom contracts and proposals for every single person you meet with especially if you have a systemized offer, you really only need the one proposal. And you know, if you wanna add a couple custom pieces to it, that's fine, but you realistically don't need to be creating custom proposals and custom contracts for every single individual that you come in contact with, because that's just gonna eat at your time. Um, so create a great one, create it once, adjust from there. Those are probably the biggest pieces in that contract, you can set yourself up for success in the finance department, essentially, um, by accepting payments up front, putting in your contract terms that allow you to auto bill. That way you're not chasing down payments, um, making sure everything is kind of taken care of there. So Miko, I don't know if you have anything to add really to the sales ops or your, your take on it, but that's... I would say like most important thing is get all that sorted and always be selling to new clients. Yeah, I, I will, I'd like to add that even in the sales process, right? You, our job as marketers tends to be, especially in the very first calls, diagnosing what the problem actually is, right? Earlier I mentioned that like, oh, you might not have a lead gen sales problem, you might have an ops problem, right? But to Laura's point, you should always have a system or way to, do two things. One, increase sales, like she had mentioned, but two, also increase lifetime value to current clients. Now that could be adding an additional service, right? It could be adding in referrals from that individual, right? Uh, there, there's multiple ways of going about it, but yeah, just to echo that, like sale, <laughs> we use close.com for some of our, our, our um, CRM capabilities. And they have this funny saying every, every I think like six or seven time you log in, it's like, you know, sales solves all problems. And like to an extent it does, because if your business runs out of cash flow, uh, profit, and, and you don't have any customers and you don't have a, a business. So yes, it might be really bad about, you know, losing clients right now, but if you have new business coming in, at least I can hold you over while you fix what we're talking about today. Yeah. So hand in hand with the sales is the marketing aspect. So that's another piece that you need to really be able to dive into, especially understanding your inbound and your outbound marketing. Your inbound marketing are going to be people that come to you. That could be from, let's say, content you post, referrals, all of those things. Having systems behind those to make sure you can have reliably you know, content going out, as well as systems in place to ask your clients for referrals that you do well for, you know, that's important. The next step is, or the next focus, and to be honest with you, this is much easier to scale up, is your outbound. These are people that you are reaching out to saying, hey, I think you're a good fit for me. I think we should have a conversation because I think I can help you. 
That's the gist of why those people come into you. So those marketing levers are incredibly valuable. So you need to be focusing on your sales, but oftentimes the problem comes where people are like, well, I'd like to focus on sales, but I don't have any meetings with new clients. How do I talk to new clients? <laughs> well, that's going to all be on your marketing efforts, right? It's going to be either your inbound or your outbound. You can create content every day. You can be asking your clients for referrals. That could get you realistically, you know, a couple meetings a month, depending on your content, depending on your, you know, niche, depending on where you posted, all these things, right? That can get you a few meetings a month. The next one you want to focus on, and arguably I would say the more important one to focus on is your outbound. This is where you can tie it in directly with your sales as in you can be testing different sales scripts and messages and see how your offer resonates before people even jump on a call with you. So the outbound is going to be the easiest to scale up because let's say you send a cold email, right? You find something that works. How do you get more meetings? Well, you just send more emails. It's kind of that simple. You buy extra domains, you send more emails. When you find things that work, you can scale that outbound up. That's a big reason to focus on outbound because it feeds directly into your sales. Those are all the most important things in your marketing operations. If your agency, if you're struggling in your agency, fix those things first. Fix your sales process, fix your marketing process. If you have new business coming in, you're not dead. You you have a way forward. You have a path forward and it's okay. So those are definitely the most important pieces to focus on. I don't know, Justine or Miko, if you guys have any comments on that, questions, um, or want to dive in deeper to that before we talk about fulfillment. Yeah, um, only other lever, you know, is typically what we, we have in our lever two system, which is database reactivation. So how do we find people that we have either sent proposals to but never signed maybe a client that really wanted to work with us but ghosted us people that were going to meet with us on a call or they did meet with us but nothing moved forward from there so most agencies are sitting on a huge database that you can then pretty quickly with context reach out to them to see if they're a good fit today so that's the only other lever that i would add in there is that you're probably sitting on a database of people you haven't asked for i'm I was working earlier uh, with, with one of our clients uh, and they have 200 people that came from a specific website that they had conversations with over the last two years, but they haven't reached out to them uh, since. All right, that's, that's, that's you know, let's say it's 30 minutes per, per person that you met with, right? Like that's, yeah, I said 200, so that's 100 hours that you spent, you know, already. So why not squeeze out a little bit more of that? So. Yeah. So with that being said, that's a really good point. One system and in, in your operations and in your, uh, especially relating to your sales operations to really get down is follow-ups. You need to be following up to people. That's where the money is often made. And that's where people are leaving the most money on the table. Usually is if you are meeting with people, but you don't follow up with them, you don't keep everything in touch. And even if you haven't met with those people yet, if you're not following up with people until you get a no, you really should be. That's important. It will help your business so much. Follow up till you get a no. It doesn't mean badger somebody, but it does mean you want to stay top of mind, right? We can talk in, in another episode about best follow-up practices. We can go more in depth into that piece specifically because it's really important, but make sure for your sales operations, your marketing operations, following up with leads, you're following up with prospects. Keep them coming in, keep them staying in your funnel, stay top of mind. Those are the goals. All of your processes should be based around those. So yeah, you can't sleep on follow-up. I mean, we've all, I have a, I have a person that we will probably be closing a fairly large deal and we connect, connected <laughs> back in uh, December of 2020. So the rest and I went full-time in the business. I went a little bit, a little, a little sooner in October and she was really quick after that in November. So like two years, <laughs> but most of it was automated. There's a couple of manual check-ins, but we're just following up, you know, so it doesn't hurt. Yeah. So having those follow-up systems in place makes it way easier to, you know, really understand kind of those pieces um, and make sure nothing kind of falls off. That's one of the biggest operation 
operational issues most individuals have is they build these systems, but they build them completely manually. That means you as a person have to do every single step for it to get done. Now, we're realistic here, so we know the reality of somebody doing everything perfectly every single time is it's 0%. It's not going to happen. That is an unrealistic expectation. As people, we are flawed. We make mistakes. It's okay. Put things into systems and you automate everything you can. Robots will fail a lot less often than we will. They're much more reliable. They do their job. They're not going to forget. If you schedule something, it's going to execute assuming that your like software and everything is functioning properly, it should work. Taking those things off of yourself, taking things off of your own plate often comes down to systemizing and automating. So as we talk about fulfillment, and I mean, honestly, everything in this conversation, I want to keep in mind that like everything that you can have a robot do, AKA everything that doesn't require complex thought, you should have a robot do. Not only is it less expensive, but like I said, there's far less failure that way. Fewer things slip through the cracks, fewer problems arise. Now, with that being said, problems arise. Problems will arise with your robots. You're gonna run out of zaps. For example, if you use Zappy or you're gonna, you know, hit walls where something isn't working or something breaks or somebody doesn't follow the process quite right and then it gets the wrong trigger and then like problems will arise, but it's far easier to fix a technical problem that you have to fix once than to fix it every single time moving forward. It's much easier to fix those. So with the fulfillment, and when I say fulfillment, I mean everything relating it to uh, getting a client that you bring on board to be successful. The first step is you need to have a detailed onboarding process. Your onboarding process should completely set up the rest of your engagement with these people to be successful. Ideally, all of the big information you need should be gotten in that onboarding process. So for example, if you need logos, if you need uh, media packs, if you whatever you might need from this client, you need to be getting that in your onboarding process. All of the things that you can anticipate that you or your team will need to make a, an engagement successful for this client you need to be collecting that in your onboarding process and storing all of those in a uniform place so that when somebody says, oh, I have a question on this client, I don't really understand what they do, or I need to go find this resource or whatever, they can just go into your onboarding folder or drive or, or whatever it is, that, however you store them, look at the onboarding docs. That will save you many, many, many times. We've learned this lesson the hard way. Please trust me, you need a good onboarding process. And ideally, it's tied to your sales process, right? So that's another thing to think about. You always want to kind of think about the client journey in stages, right? When they leave the sales stage, they need to go into the onboarding stage. When they leave the onboarding stage, they need to go into the project phase or the ongoing management phase. I mean, it definitely depends on what you do as an agency. But that's all really important. The transition from each stage should be smooth and the client should understand where they are at. So with that, you need to have everything written out in a step-by-step -step process. And ideally you communicate that to your client. You know, you, they sign the contracts, they pay everything, everything's good. They're ready to start. First thing they do is they get an email that says, hey, here's what our onboarding process looks like. Break it out into steps so they understand. This is what needs to happen, then this, then this, then this, then this. That's how they know whether they're on track, what they need to do, what you are doing, how you guys can work together in that way. And it, again, sets those expectations. That is a huge place for client failure is not good expectations. They expect the moon and they have the budget for, you know, a piece of satellite. That's just how it realistically works. You want to make sure you're managing those expectations. And then you wanna make sure your processes are simple to deliver as much as possible. Again, a lot of that comes down to just automating as much as you can. To do that, you typically need to build a manual process, a manual system, and then dive in from there. Once you have your manual system, then you take a look at it and you say, okay, what in this process do I not need to have a person do? What in this process can I have be automated so that nobody has to touch it again? 
that's all really important. And along with that goes your documentation and reporting. Every step in your process should have a detailed uh, SOP or standard operating procedure to go alongside it. That way, if somebody gets stuck, you can say, okay, here's the resource to go over everything. Then they can ideally look at that. If they have any additional questions, then you address those. But that's the easiest way to get those questions answered in a time effective way. And then the final piece of that is reporting. Make sure that as you are fulfilling, that you can report on your progress, what you're doing, where you're at, timelines, you know, things that have been accomplished, things that need to happen. Make sure you have detailed reporting for those things because that makes a huge difference as well, not just to your own team, understanding and detailing out all of those pieces, but also to the client, again, managing their expectations. So I don't know, Justine or Nico, if you guys have any additional comments. I know we've all had many, many positive and negative experiences when it comes to fulfillment for clients. And we've all experienced a lot of processes get created and some of them get uncreated because we decided they weren't great or, you know, switched to something else. Um, do we have any other comments kind of around fulfillment? Yeah, just communication is really important and setting those boundaries, like you said or not boundaries, expectations um, is very important just so they know what to expect when and like setting that timeline up for them so that they know when to expect stuff from you. Boundaries and communication are important too and should be considered in your operations. If a client calls you at 10 p.m., don't answer. <laughs> they should Unless understand. you have it in your contract, do so, right? Like that's yeah, unless you have in your contracts that you're on call 24 seven, sure. But otherwise, you know, that's a big part of your operations is making sure ex expectations are set, boundaries are set, and those are met and maintained. Those are key to a good working relationship. So beyond fulfillment is really gonna come down to two final pieces, which are certainly incredibly important. And, you know, finance is probably the most important of these two. Um, I'll briefly touch on like security first, I guess, just because that's pretty simple. You just wanna make sure you're protecting your assets. If you use the same password for everything, stop it. Get a password manager, use secure passwords. When I say secure passwords, nothing that relates to you, to anything you know, it, a password that you even know is not a secure password. It should ideally be a ton of random characters, random string, not something that you could even remember if you tried, right? And it should be different for every single login that you have. We use LastPass, it's a really effective way and that's how we share passwords back and forth between our team. It's secure uh, and you can generate secure passwords with it and store all of your passwords in there. You should not rely on yourself to remember passwords ever. If you have the same password in multiple places, keep in mind, if that one site gets breached, you are now opening up every other area of your business to that liability. It's not a smart move to use the same password for everything or use something that's really uh, easily guessed or relates even to you or your industry. You know, you don't want it to be even recognizable words. Those are too easy to guess. So random string of characters as long as you possibly can for the fields that you have and you know as complicated as possible the best thing about that though is if you use a password manager you don't have to remember any of it and you should there are many free options lastpass has a free option would definitely recommend Even nico any thoughts there and you're the compliance person so let's listen to you yeah, I yell at people for that password all the time. That's not secure enough. We'll make a new one. <laughs> yeah, and like the nice thing about LastPass too, it'll tell you if one of your passwords is weak. So it'll like suggest that you change it too. So that's always a nice feature to have. Yeah, it's just especially as we live in a very technical world, there is technical good and technical bad. People will be coming in, in an effort to take things from you. That should be the expected result. So make sure that you're protecting yourself against that the best way you can. 
all your passwords different. Your bank password, especially anything that touches your card, anything you pay for, all those passwords should be like as long as possible. Your bank password should be like 50 characters long. You know, keep it as secure as you possibly can so that people can't guess it. And it's not even about people guessing it. A lot of people have different machines and, uh, you know, they'll use, for example, like supercomputers to put in every single possible combination to try to guess your passwords. The longer they are, the more permutations they are, and it's much harder to guess your password. So keep all those things in mind. The next biggest thing uh, to making sure, and you know, all these pieces are really important, but this one is realistically the most important. And I know I already said like sales is your first priority and sales is your first priority, but your finance is your most important piece. So you need to know who you have in your pipeline. You need to know what to be able to expect Again, setting expectations, not just for clients is important, but for yourself as well. Know what you can expect to earn in the next two to six weeks. That's huge, right? Making sure you know your financial position. And you also should be keeping ample cash in the bank. So at least two payroll periods should just be sitting in a savings account. Don't touch it unless you absolutely need to, but that's your biggest thing, right? You need to be able to pay people who do work for you. That's important. Next thing you want to do is just make it as easy as possible for people to pay you. I think I mentioned this earlier, we do auto billing, we set it all up in our contracts, so people authorize us to do that, they give us the authorized card to charge, uh, and it, it's all set up. That way, we don't have a huge accounts receivable balance, because accounts receivable, you're also rarely going to get 100% of that. Yeah, we didn't take someone down for a year for them to pay, so. I don't even think they've paid that invoice. I still see it unpaid. Like they paid no, no, they, it, but they, I think they paid all of it. I, th I think they just, uh, yeah, whatever. We'll talk about it later. Yeah, regardless, we have spent so much time chasing people down. It's way easier just to, at the beginning of the engagement, say, this is how much you're going to pay us. This is when it's going to be charged to your card that you give to us on file. And we will take it all from there. It's and we do invoices upon request, but limiting your accounts receivable is helpful. And also one thing we do to help on the finance side is we take all of our payments up front. So before we do a month of service for somebody, they've already paid for that month of service. That is really helpful to making sure that like your cash flow is effective and you can execute for that client because they've already paid for that service. And then also, let's say somebody fires you, you then don't have to chase down that person to pay an invoice who's already fired you. Get them to pay and they're done. They fire you, you, can, you say, okay, great. There'll be no future invoices and you turn it off. That is way easier to say than, oh, you just fired us because you weren't happy with us. Well, here's a bill, please pay it. The likelihood that they're going to is much lower than uh, I think people would probably in general like. So. The only other piece that's important with the finance levels, yes, you need to know exactly, you know, who's in your current pipeline, to who you can expect to come in, who's in your, like, who are your actual current clients, how much do they pay you, where does all that money come from, what services is that attributed to, you need to know all that. You also need to be able to rank those clients by your confidence levels. That way you can say, I'm not feeling so confident about client C, I think they're going to drop next month. I don't want to even assume that I will have that income next month. That way you can kind of plan around those things. But if you're super confident about client A, you can say, okay, great. I'm 99% sure nothing's going to happen with this client. I think that's income I can count on. So those are all, I think, the big pieces, I would say, like that helps an agency run effectively. Um, at least to make sure you don't have any huge missing pieces. So um, any thoughts on, I, I guess any of those things or questions or points we can maybe dive deeper into? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, because we're coming up on the uh, the time allotted, but um, I, think, I think the biggest thing that I will say in closing is like, we're throwing a lot at you and nothing 
happens all at once. So the biggest thing I would say is like really break down where is the biggest like needle mover in the business, right? Break it down. Is it on a sales ops or is it on fulfillment ops, right? And then pick one thing, master it, get it really good and tighten up before you move on to other things. Biggest problem that we've seen is like people just try to take everything uh, all at once and then nothing changes. So that's the only feedback I'll say, but stay tuned. Part two will be next time or we'll, we'll scatter those, uh, those over. Um, uh, really, we do value anyone who, you know, not anyone, uh, you. Uh, as you listen through this, give us feedback on what sounds interesting, where can we go more in depth, and how we can continue making this podcast and all our content centered around how to grow your agency. So if you have any questions, let me know, Nico at GetBalancedMedia.com, follow our YouTube channel, GetBalancedMedia.com, go to our website, GetBalancedMedia.com, I'm even getting tired of saying GetBalancedMedia.com, but I'll say it one more time, GetBalancedMedia.com, have a great week, talk to you guys later.